Amen. Good afternoon to all of you. It's an honor to have you join us even for the lunch hour this afternoon. May the Lord bless you even for joining and for also tuning in. I request you to also share the link even to others that they may be able to join and also partake of the blessing of the Lord even in this platform in Jesus' mighty name. So even as we begin the lunch hour, I want you to just go before the Lord and just appreciate him for his faithfulness and for his goodness upon your life and just lift up his name this afternoon in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name. So let us just go ahead and just give him thanks this afternoon in Jesus' mighty name. Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for this wonderful afternoon. Thank you for your goodness upon our lives, almighty King of glory. Thank you for your tender mercies, almighty Jehovah. Thank you for the far that you have brought us, almighty King of glory. <clears throat> thank you for the things you have done. Thank you for the things that you are yet to do, almighty King of glory. Father, we appreciate and we honor you this afternoon, almighty Jehovah. <clears throat> Aboshaka Shaka Rabakunta Ribazanta Rababazaya, Reke Bekzita Rabakunta Ribazanta Rababazaya. We thank you for your shield and your protection, Almighty Jehovah, over our lives, over our families, over our nation, Almighty King of Glory. Father, we appreciate and we honor you, Almighty Jehovah. Rimakunta Zinta Rabakunta Rabazaya, Reke Bebeshaka Rabakunta Ribazanta Rababazaya, Makunta Ribazanta Rabakunta Ribazanta Rababazaya. Somebody, I want you to pray this afternoon. Lord, may you fill me with more of you in the mighty name of Jesus. May you find more of his presence upon your life, more of his spirit upon your life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rimakunta Zinta Rababazaya, Manturobo Zinta Rabakunta Rababazaya, more of his touch upon your life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rimakunta Ribazanta Rababazaya. In the mighty name of Jesus is a Rimakunta Zanta Rababazaya, Riki Bebishaka Rabakunta Rababazaya, Rikunta Ribazanta. This afternoon, may you be lifted, may you be glorified in our midst, Almighty Jehovah. Makunta Zanta Rababazaya, Riki Bebishaka. May you be adored this afternoon in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Rimakunta Zanta Rababazaya, Riki Bebishaka Rabakunta Rababazaya, Makunta Ribazanta Manto Robozaya, Riki Bebishaka Rabakunta. We thank you for the Almighty King of Glory. Thank you for the shepherd. Father, we appreciate you this afternoon, Almighty Jehovah. Makunta Ribazanta Manto Robozaya. Rike Bebe Shaka Rabakunta Rababazaya. Rikunta Ribazanta Manto Robozaya. Rike Bebe Shaka Rabakunta Rabazaya. Rimakanta Rabakunta Rababazaya. Rike Bebe Shaka Rabakunta Rabazaya. This afternoon, Minister our hearts, Almighty Jehovah, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, let there be fresh touch, let there be transformation upon our lives, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Father, we give you praise and Lord, we give you honor, may you be in the mighty name we pray, amen. I want us to turn to the word of God in the book of Proverbs chapter number 18, Proverbs chapter number 18, I'll read verse number 20 and 21. The Bible says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruits of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall, shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruits thereof. Amen. So I want us to know that our words are so important and our words are so powerful. And it's the desire of God for us to create things in our lives by, by our utterance. Amen. Every time you utter the word of God in the atmosphere or in the spiritual realm, you find that that word begins to create and to form things even in our lives. And this afternoon, what I want us to do, I want us to cancel every negative words that have been speaking in our lives. And I want us to declare the word of God, what the word of God says concerning our lives, concerning our families, concerning our nation, our churches. I want us to speak those words in the mighty name of Jesus. The book of Isaiah chapter number 25 also, Isaiah chapter number 25, I'll read verse, from verse number 7. The Bible says, and he will, he will destroy in this mountain 
cast and the face of covering that, that is cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. I want us to declare even this afternoon, anything speaking death in your life, in your destiny, in your family, of our nation. I want us to declare it is cancelled in the mighty name of Jesus. And he says that he will swallow up death in victory. Amen. Anything speaking sickness, anything negative, in your life. I want us to declare it is cancelled in the mighty name of Jesus. He says that he will swallow up death in victory and he will wipe tears from off all faces. I want us to declare in this year 2023 we are not experiencing death but we are experiencing the life of Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us go ahead. I want you to speak over your life. Speak over your business. Speak over your family. Speak over the church of Christ. Speak over the nation of Kenya and I want us to speak words of life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you, we give you glory, and we give you praise. Rimakunta, Rivazanta, Manto, Robozanta, Rababazaya. You say life and death are in the power of the tongue, Almighty Jehovah. This afternoon, we stand to decree, Almighty King of glory, every negative occurrences of our lives, every negative words of our families, of our destinies, over the words of our hands, over the church of Christ, Almighty King of glory, over the nation of Kenya. Father, we nullify by the blood of Jesus. Rimakunta, you say every tongue that rise against us in judgment, we shall condemn Almighty King of glory. No weapon that is formed against us shall be able to prosper. Father, we stand to decree every words of darkness that has been standing as a weapon to prosper over our lives. Father, we come so by the blood of Jesus Christ. You say you shall swallow up death in victory. Every word speaking death in our lives. Every word speaking death in our families. Every word speaking death in our churches, in the nation of Kenya. Of our marriages, our destinies, my God. Father, we cancel by the blood of Jesus. We declare it will not stand, it will not prevail. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You say every word shall pass away, but your word shall stand, almighty King of glory. Somebody, I want you to begin to prophesy and to speak positive words over your life, over your destiny, over the church of Christ, over the nation of Kenya. In the mighty name of Jesus, you say in your word, my God, with long life shall you satisfy us, O God. Therefore, we stand to decree every word of death, every word of defeat, every word of failure, every word of discouragement, Almighty Jehovah. They are coming Sold by the blood of Jesus. Makunta riva zanta raba bazaya. Reke bebe shaka raba kunta raba zaya. Makunta riva zanta every words of demotion. Father, we nullify by the power in the blood of Jesus. Rima kunta zanta raba bazaya. Somebody, I want you to speak up. Every projection of darkness over your life through dreams, I want you to cancel by the power in the blood of Jesus. Every negative dreams that have been speaking over your life, that has been speaking over your destiny, over your family, over the nation of Kenya, we cancel by the power in the blood of Jesus. Rimakunta riva zanta rababazaya. Rike bebe shaka manto we declare we are lifted my God in the mighty name of Jesus we declare the strength of God upon our lives in the mighty name of Jesus we declare success my God in everything we do in the mighty name of Jesus we declare we are prospering my God in every area of our lives in the mighty name of Jesus we decree the light of God uh, is shining on our way in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Rimakunta Riva Zanta Rabazaya. Death is swallowed up, my God, uh, of our nation in the name of Jesus. Uh, death is swallowed up, my God, uh, of our families in the name of Jesus. Uh, nobody shall die prematurely in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, we shall live to declare the goodness of the Lord uh, in the land of the living. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, uh, we speak life of our loved ones uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Rimakunta Riva Zanta. 
Zaya, Rikebebe Shaka Manto Robo Zaya, Rikunta Rikzanta Rababa Zaya, Rikebebe Shaka Walls of Preservation, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rikunta Ribazanta Rababa Zaya, Manto Robo Zinta, thank you, my father, Manto Robo Zanta, every incantation, every chanting upon our lives, of our destinies, my God, Father, we now live. By the power in the blood of Jesus, Rimakunta, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that speaks better things than that of Abel. Let it begin to speak upon our lives. Let it begin to speak of our children. Let it begin to speak of our spouses. Let it begin to speak of our churches. Let it begin to speak over the nation of Kenya in the mighty name of Jesus. Makunta Ribazanta Mantoro Bozaya. Rike Baby Shaka. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you glory and we give you praise. May you be lifted and may you be exalted. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I want us also to read from the word of God in the book of Ezekiel chapter number 12. Ezekiel chapter number 12. I'll read from verse number 25. The Bible says, For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say a word and will perform it, says the Lord. Verse number 28. Therefore say, say, say unto them, that says the Lord God, there shall no more of my words be prolonged anymore, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord God. So we are going to declare even this afternoon that the word of God that he has spoken even over our lives, that it is manifesting in the name of Jesus, is the one who has said that his word shall no longer be prolonged. I want us to speak over this year, 2023, that we are experiencing the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus. The word of God is becoming a reality of our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, Isaiah 55, verse number 11. The Bible says, so, so shall my word be that, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not, not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which, which I please, and it shall prosper in the things where, where to I sent it. Amen. I want us to declare this afternoon. Lord, may your word prosper in our lives. May your word prosper over your church. May your word prosper over the nation of Kenya. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let us keep speaking in Jesus' mighty name. Let us go ahead and declare it in Jesus' mighty name. Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you. You say in your word, Almighty King of glory, that no longer shall your word be prolonged, Almighty Jehovah. And that which you have spoken, Almighty Jehovah, you shall cause it to come to pass, Almighty King of Glory. You say your word shall not return to you void without accomplishing that which you have sent it to do. But that word shall prosper, my God. That which you have sent it, my God, even to prosper in the name of Jesus. We stand to decree this afternoon. Let your word prosper in our lives. Let your word prosper over our destinies in the name of Jesus. Let your word prosper, my God of our families in the mighty name of Jesus. Makunta Rabazaya, Rike Bebe Shaka Mantoro Bozaya, Rikunta Rivazanta for the works of our hands that your word shall prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. Rimakunta Rivazanta Mantoro Bozaya, let there be a performance of your word even in our midst in the mighty name of Jesus. Makunta Rivazanta Rabazaya, Rike Bebe Shaka, somebody I want you to take, to take authority over every cycle, every embargo of delay. I want you to declare it is broken in the name of Jesus, uh, that the word of God is prospering in our lives. Uh, it is manifesting in the mighty name of Jesus. Rimakunta Rivazanta Rababazaya, Rike Bebe Shaka Mantoro Bozaya, Rikunta Rizanta Rabakuria, Mantoro Bozinta Rababazaya, Rike Bebe Shaka, every power of delay, every power of stagnation, my God, uh, around our lives, Almighty King of Glory. Father, we stand to decree by the power in the blood of Jesus. Uh, it is broken this afternoon. Uh, it is broken broken this afternoon, every altars of darkness that have been speaking delay, that has been speaking failure, that has been causing us to move in cycle. Father, we declare it is broken this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let your word prosper in our lives. Let your word prosper in our destinies. Let your word prosper in our marriages over the nation of Kenya. Let your word prosper in our churches. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rimakunta Rizanta Rababazaya, Rike Bezanta Rabakuria, Makunta Rivazanta Rabazaya. You say you have good plans for us. 
our plan to prosper us, uh, to give us a hope and a good future. Father, we stand to decree the plan and the purposes of God are uh, uh, prospering over our lives. Uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rimakunta uh, Rivazanta Mantoro Bozaya, Rekebebe Shaka Mantoro Bozaya, that which was intended for evil. Father, we thank you because you are turning to our good. Uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Rimakunta uh, Rivazanta Rababazaya, Father, we give you praise and we give you honor. May you be lifted and may you be exalted. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I want us to also finish with the word of God in the book of Psalms 91. The book of Psalms 91. I'll read from verse number three. Psalms 91. I'll read from verse number three. I want, the Bible says, Surely he shall deliver thee from the sneer of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shall thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flyeth by day, nor of, for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. So we are going to declare every arrows of darkness assigned against our lives. I want us to declare it is destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. The book of Zechariah chapter number two, verse number five. The Bible says that you shall be a wall of fire around us. And we are going to declare even this afternoon, may the Lord be a wall of fire around us in the mighty name of Jesus. Every arrows of darkness assigned against us, it shall not prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. May he deliver us from the sneer of the fowler in the mighty name of Jesus. May he cover us with this, with this feathers in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us go ahead and declare it in Jesus' mighty name. Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you this afternoon. You say in your word, you shall deliver us, my God, from the sneer of the fowler, my God, and from the noisome pestilence, almighty King of glory. We shall not be afraid of the arrows that fly by day. Father, we stand to decree even this afternoon, every arrows of infirmity, arrows of darkness assigned against our lives. Rima Punta Rikazinta Rababa Zaya. Reke Bebe Shaka assigned against our families. Assigned against our destinies. Father, we declare it backfires in the name of Jesus. You say a thousand shall fall on our side. Ten thousand on our right hand. But they shall not come near us in the name of Jesus. Rima Punta Rikazinta Rababa Zaya. Reke Bebe Shaka Manto Robo Zaya. May you be a wall of fire around us in the name of Jesus. Somebody speak over the nation of Kenya that the Lord shall be a wall of fire around this nation in the mighty name of Jesus. Speak over the body of Christ. Speak over the church of Christ. May the Lord be a wall of fire around us in the mighty name of Jesus. Speak over the works of our hands that the Lord shall be a, a wall of fire around us in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, speak over your family in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, may the Lord be a wall of fire around our families uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I want us to finish by declaring that God is bringing us to the place of rest, uh, that his word is becoming a reality in our lives. Uh, in the mighty name of Jesus, declare it. Uh, Lord, may you bring us to the place of rest. Uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, uh, he says in his word, after we have suffered a while, Makunta Rivazai shall strengthen us. He shall establish us. I want us to declare establishment of this year in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Rimakunta Rivazanta Rababazaya. Rike Bebe Shaka says in his word that he shall follow you. His word to completion. I want us to declare this afternoon uh, that Lord, may you follow your word to completion in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Rimakunta Rivazanta Rababazaya. Riki Bebe Shaka Mantoro Bozaya. Rikunta Rivazanta Mantoro Bozaya. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you praise. Uh, may you be lifted and may you be exalted. May you establish us, O oh God. Uh, may you establish our going out and our coming in uh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, may you establish the works of our hands uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Uh, let there be a Establishment in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that which he started doing, I want you to declare you shall finish in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that there shall be establishment, there shall be completion in the name of Jesus. You shall not be stuck this year in the mighty name of Jesus. You shall not be hindered this year in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let there be completion over that destiny in the name of Jesus. Makunta represent over that project. Let there be a completion in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you and Father, we bless you. Lord, we give you praise and we give you honor.
May you be lifted and may you be exalted. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for your time. I just want to hand it over to Pastor Pancras in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you so much, Pastor Margaret, and welcome, everyone. It's a blessing to see every one of you guys being here together with us. Uh, we are building on precept upon precept, line upon line, and we are trusting God that God is actually helping every one of you guys to gain something and uh, also to be able to uh, see to it that your family is also given that which God has intended. Uh, we in Judges chapter number six, and as we flip our Bibles there, Judges chapter six again, we will do from verses number uh, 22. As we flip our Bibles there, please be encouraged to continually invite others uh, by sharing either the Zoom link or the Facebook link, depending with which platform you're actually watching from. Uh, please go ahead and also share. Elaine, if you don't mind, you could also mute. Uh, Elaine, Sister Elaine, kindly just uh, mute. Your microphone is on. Elaine, can you thank you? Yeah, so uh, we want to encourage you to at least invite a friend or two and let's build up this thing uh, even as we continue. Judges chapter number six, we will read verses number 20. Um, we will do verse number 24 to verses number 26. Verses number 24 to verse 26, just to narrow down the scriptures for today and immediately go on point to deal with what we need. The Bible says, and then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. And to this day, it is yet in offer of the Abiezerites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old and throw it down and, and throw down the altar of Baal, thy father, uh, that thy father has and cut down the groove that is by it the, and, uh, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock uh, in the ordered place and take the second bullock uh, and offer a burnt a sacrifice with the wood of the groove which thou shalt cut down. Amen and amen. God's word is completely blessed. Okay, so we are talking about understanding altars. If you've been with us from the very beginning, we've been speaking about the aspect of the significance of houses. Uh, defining what houses are and talking about three consistent things that come with the houses. We talked about prophetic destinies, we talked about altars, and we also talked about patterns. Uh, last week we majored on prophetic destinies, and now we are talking about the aspect of uh, uh, altars that exist in houses. So we zeroed in in the fact of talking about the aspect of family altars uh, and how important it is to understand the altars that exist in families, how to deal with them, and also how to be able to notice them and their activities in uh, uh, your family bloodlines. It's very critical for you to understand that every family has an altar. The account we've just been able to read right now in the book of Judges, chapter number, number six and verse 24, uh, verse 25 and verse 26 reveals to us uh, three altars. The first altar we are able to see here is an altar that uh, Gideon builds for the Lord after an encounter that he has. And then he calls the place in which he actually establishes an altar, Jehovah Shalom. Shalom here speaks of peace. And we all know very well that when the Bible talks of, for example, the king or the prince of peace, we are uh, the, the, the king of peace. We are talking of Jesus himself being the king of peace or the prince of peace. So uh, being the king of peace or the prince of peace, when we are talking about him being called Jehovah Shalom, then we can basically say in this context here, uh, correlating it with the New Testament reality we are in, we can say that the first uh, altar that Gideon actually experienced here is the altar of making a covenant with God by himself. So he came into covenant with God, which we then put in our context as the covenant of salvation or the New Testament covenant in which we can say that Gideon actually experienced salvation, so to say. So in our context, the first altar we actually get to experience in the New Testament reality is our relationship with Christ. And that altar is established on the cross on Calvary when we acknowledge our sins and acknowledge the need of accepting Jesus as the only way to receiving salvation. Number two, we see here an altar that is actually told about, which exists in his father's house. And he is told by the angel of God to destroy it. 
So in every house, there is an altar. In every family, there is an altar. And it might be a demonic altar that is actually uh, strong enough to try and bind bloodlines and bind family or generations with the intent of limiting people. And so Gideon is told that he has to deal with it and to break that altar and even the groove that was existing with it specifically because there was an assignment that existed on him or in his life. So there was a reason why he had to break the family altar. Two of them, one to assist the family to be free of the existing altar because altars are power or altars are places of powers and altars can hold a bloodline, can hold a family, can hold a generation can hold a territory, can hold a nation or a region. And in the context that we are looking at, altars have power to hold bloodlines and families. So he had to go ahead to exercise that so that his own family would be free. But besides that, even the altar that was existent right there in his family was also designed to limit Gideon himself. He could not be able to, arise, to rise or to emerge if the, if the altar in his father's house was consistently active. Remember, that is why the book of Genesis chapter number 12 tells us that God told Abraham, come out of your country, your uh, kindred and out of your father's house. God was simply trying to tell this man that there is something that can be existent in your father's house that can become an inhibiting factor or a limiting factor to the progress of destiny or to the fulfillment of destiny that existed in his life. So God told Gideon, you have to deal with your father's altar. Break it down. And I've said here that every family has an existing altar. Uh, it might be godly. It might be ungodly. And we will look at that as we continue. Then number, number three, we see in verse number 26 that God told Gideon to erect an altar in that same house. And he told him it will be in the place that is ordered. He will lay there a sacrifice. Why? Because God wanted him to set up a new order, a new order for himself and for his bloodline also. And so that's why we actually began to look at what an altar is. We said yesterday, an altar is a place of convergence between a man and a deity or a man and a spirit being. It's a place of convergence or interaction between a man and a spirit being. In our context here, we are talking of God, but also looking at it in a general context, it can be a demonic spirit. Number two, uh, we are also saying an altar is a place of encounter between a man or a place a man encounters a spirit being, um, a place where a man encounters a spirit being. So where an altar is, it's where a spirit being just doesn't come to interact with you, but also you have an opportunity to also encounter it. Uh, Wahoo, kindly, if you don't mind. Thank you. All right. So it's a place where a man encounters a spirit being. Number three, an altar is a platform that a spirit being, uh, a spirit being finds a highway to express itself in the world of men. It's a platform in which a spirit being finds a highway to express itself in the world of men. That's why we pray. When we pray, God himself finds a highway for his will to find expression in our own world. We cannot see the will of God taking course in our life if we do not pray. It says, let your kingdom come and your will that is in heaven may take place in on earth or in the world of men. So remember that we spoke about different aspects of altars. We explained that an altar uh, basically is a place of release of power. We also explained that an every altar has priests there's no altar that does not have a priest. We, uh, we actually go to see that. We also explain that nothing on earth or uh, nothing that we talk of progress in the world of men can take course if there is no altar. And this place where we're talking about altar is where spirits find expression. So everything in the natural rides on the force of the spiritual. And altars are the platforms that permit the spiritual to constantly find expression so that the natural may find progress and prosperity. We also say that an existing altar, whether you know it or you don't, can, will automatically have an effect uh, in your life, will have an effect in your life or in your family. So we zeroed in yesterday in closing in looking at two altars. We say there's a godly altar and we also say there's a demonic altar. Demonic altar here, we say it can actually exist in view of your bloodline or what we call bloodline iniquity. Demonic altars ride on bloodline iniquity. Number two, on generational curses. Now curses are also places where disobedience was and covenants were also made. Don't forget that. <clears throat> Number three, we said an altar 
that is demonic can also ride on intention, what we call intentions, intentions. And the intentions here are where there's demonic agreements where people can intentionally get, get into covenants or agreements with demonic. So we see rituals being done. Uh, we see covenants also being made. And in that platform, then automatically, we automatically get to see uh, people experiencing demonic altars being activated. We also talked about evil intents or evil thoughts evil intents or evil thoughts. And we looked at Genesis chapter number six, where God spoke about the evil thoughts, imaginations that was existing in men. Genesis six and verses number five and verse number six. And because of that, God destroyed man. God destroyed man in verses number seven. So these are things we are able to deal with. Now let's talk about the godly altar. Okay, so based on Judges chapter number six, we were able to explain here uh, that because of God, I mean, Gideon encountering uh, an angel of the Lord, which basically is God himself in this, uh, in this context, we were able to explain that this was a, God, a godly altar, altar was developed, which was in our context, the aspect of the cross or a man receiving Christ. So when we talk about a godly altar, the first thing that we actually get to observe is the first godly altar is the cross that Jesus died on. And that simply speaks about salvation that we accept when we come to the cross of Calvary. When we accept Jesus, immediately we are brought into a place of experience in the altar, which is where we encounter God on the cross of Calvary. We encounter Jesus when we accept, the, we accept him as our Lord and Savior. This automatically deals with bloodline iniquities and also generational curses. When we get saved, it deals with bloodline iniquity and generational curses. Now, remember, every man born of a woman automatically comes in with bloodline iniquities. The book of Psalms, chapter number 50, shows us of how David goes ahead before God to make repentance of his sin, Psalms 51. And he explains that uh, man born, let me just go there, Psalms chapter number 51. And uh, let me show you this so that it could be able to explain to us when he's doing repentance of iniquity. In verse number five of Psalms chapter number 51, David says, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So every man born of a woman is born with the nature of sin and also having the shape of iniquity on the inside of them. But when we accept Jesus, that part of iniquity is washed away. Iniquity is removed. It is blotted away. And not only that, also the curse is dealt with. Galatians chapter number three and verses number 13 and verse number 14. The Bible says, and therefore cast be the man that hung it on a tree. And therefore, because Christ became a curse, he was able to take away the curse from us. Remember that Galatians chapter number three, we could go there, verses number 13 and verses number 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cast is everyone <clears throat> that hung it on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the spirit, I mean, the promise of the spirit through faith. So the curse was dealt with when we accepted Jesus himself. So the first altar that we talk about is the altar of the cross, the altar that Jesus himself brought about when he paid the ultimate price for all humanity. That altar deals with the, the generational curse and it also deals with what we consider as bloodline battles. Please kindly, if your microphone is on, if you don't mind, you could go ahead and mute it. If your microphone is on, kindly just mute it. Thank you so much. Uh, God, if you don't mind, you could mute your microphone. Thank you. Uh, so we've been able to establish the aspect of the blood. Uh, I mean, Jesus himself, uh, being the ultimate uh, altar uh, when he actually died on the cross on Calvary. There's also an altar uh, in the New Testament reality, which is an altar of our own bodies. Our bodies also act as an altar. Uh, Romans chapter number 12 and verses number one, the Bible says, Paul speaking, I beseech you, brethren, by the masses of God to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, you cannot talk of a sacrifice without an altar. Paul, again, in the book of First Corinthians chapter number six, explains that our bodies are the temple of God. The word temple and altar is also the same if you study scripture well enough. So our bodies also become an altar. And the Bible explains to us, we offer it unto God. Our bodies are a place where there's a convergence of spirit. The Bible speaks 
very clearly in the book of John chapter 14, that when we will actually accept Jesus, I'm paraphrasing it, Jesus says that I and the Father will come in and dwell in you. The scripture also calls our bodies a temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So our bodies are actually altars. We ourselves are moving altars. We must always understand that, that when we accepted Jesus, he came in and dwelt in us. Our hearts are the altars in which God makes, we, in which we have interactions with God himself. So if we are talking about our bodies being taken care of, then we are also dealing with it being in view of a family altar. That's one of the core reasons why sins like immorality are very powerful. Sexual sin is very powerful because when you go ahead and you commit sexual sin literally you have opened up a generation into an iniquity even when you're born again if you commit sin sexually the bible says that, that is the only sin against the body so it opens up sin and what we call an iniquity that can affect your children and your children's children that's the reason why you should do your best to avoid sexual sin at all costs the ability to stay pure and to keep your body holy automatically secures a generation did you even know that any time that the enemy wants to go ahead to bind a generation he looks for a man's semen semen spam spamatazoa so the moment a man releases semen satan can use that against your children and he can make that uh, you know, they even say that in the demonic world, sometimes if people want to bind a destiny for the generation of our people is that they would set up a woman to go and sleep with a man. And then the woman would go ahead and take the semen of the man and make cast a spell against the generations that would come uh, after that man. Now, that's why we have to take care of our own bodies and what comes out of us. Even for a woman, learn to take care of you because when a man comes into you, you the Bible explains that whoever sleeps with a heart becomes one. So you partake of the nature of the one you sleep with. You have to be very careful. Take care of your body. I remember I dealt with a woman and she told me of one of the relationships she came into, uh, that when she came into a, a relationship with this woman, I mean, this man back in Mombasa, uh, even after she got born again, the man told her that anytime I will desire you, you will find your way back to me. And indeed, anytime that man just desired this woman, the woman just couldn't control herself. She found a way calling the man and found herself sleeping with the man again, even after she got sick. So we have to pray for her to get delivered out of this particular force because whoever sleeps with the handle becomes one. So the one you sleep with comes into you and there's a way that they begin to influence you, whether you believe it or you don't. A lady talked to me and the lady was telling me how she noticed that she was struggling with lesbianism, which was uncommon. She began just to find an attraction uh, with the same sex. So she asked me, Pastor, this is a bit absurd. I have never had it in my life. Now she came to me, God saved, but she had a struggle with a certain guy uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, staying with the person and still living a life of uh, uh, what we call immorality. So I told her openly that after having gotten saved, there's a fruit of repentance. You have literally to live the life of salvation. But if you continue living with that man, then that is sin and it opens you up to all manner of attacks. The lady didn't listen, didn't, wasn't willing to give up that life. And they shifted from Eldred, went all the way to Kisumu. And months later is when she writes to me and tells me that she's finding herself attracted to other women. And that is when I questioned and I asked the question number one, are you still with the same man? The lady said, yes. Question number two, is a man still sleeping out with the other women? The lady said, yes. And then question number three, I asked her, are you two also going out? She told me, yes. She told me, Pastor, when I, I continually noticed that this guy is given to sleep around, I too decided to go out and also sleep around. And that is when I actually boldly spoke to her. And this is what I told her. I told her then there are probabilities that that man may have slept with a lady who is actually a lesbian. You know, they are, I don't know whether they call them bisexuals or heterosexuals, people that can sleep both with the same sex and also the opposite sex. And so I ended up telling her, telling her that the probability she may, he may have slept with a lesbian or you may have slept with another man who slept with a lesbian. So that spirit found its way into you. And that's why all of a sudden you're finding an interest to sleep with other women. Please listen to me. Take care of your body. Your body is an altar. You are a walking altar. You have to be careful with the way you handle yourself. There's also what we call a family corporate altar. There's also what we call a family corporate altar. Now, let me explain what this is. Every family has a corporate altar. And this is something that's one of the reasons why a father must learn to lead his own uh, household even to a place of worship. You have to understand that a father must lead his family to a place of worship. 
So God always ordains every family to have a place, a corporate place of a worship. And now, it begins with your own house, but it also has a specific place where you lead your own family. So if you look at Genesis chapter number 18, quickly go there and verses number 19, we see God speaking of Abraham. The Bible says this, for I know him. Let's start with verses number 17, Genesis 18, verses number 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham this thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse number 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and he shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. So notice something here that was taken place. God was so covered, I mean, sure that Abraham had the ability to command his family towards a specific pathway. So that is what now we could consider as a family corporate altar. Every person that is considered as a head of a family must always have the wisdom and capability to guide his own household towards a corporate altar. It might be within the family setting. It might be a church that you lead your family towards so that your children can grow up in a certain pattern and also your own house can be bound within that particular altar so that it can fight for you. When you get children, you must commit them to be dedicated to God. You as a father and a mother may dedicate your children to God, but also you must have a mantle that speaks over your head and where you go to and where you can also have your children dedicated. These are things that you have to understand that's why Gideon had to break one altar and erect another altar. And from that time, what it basically was to speak about is that his own family had to operate on the same context. Did you notice that when Eli's children were doing the opposite, the people were angry when they would ask him, why are your children doing the opposite? God himself was angry because in that family, there was supposed to be a priesthood mantle that was to be consistent over the children. Have you noticed that even when Samuel took up, his own children were to have a flow of the same mantle, but he did not succeed to direct his children in the context of the family altar, family corporate altar, so that he trained his children in the way of the Lord. He failed in that context. So God had to constantly raise up other people. Every family has a priesthood mantle that only functions effectively on altars that we erect. Okay, so you have to learn to train your children in the way of the Lord. You cannot allow only your, I mean, allow uh, your house girl or your house boy or allow your helpers or allow the Sunday school teachers to be the only ones that train up your children. You must be one that is committed to make sure your family is engaged in an altar. Your wife is trained in that order. Your husband is trained in that order. The Bible says a faith I see in you, Timothy. I also saw in your grandmother, Lois, and I saw in your mother, Eunice. So there was a transparency of spirit because an altar was active in that family. And that's one of the things that we have to understand. God intends that there must be a Godly altar active in every house, in every house, in every house. That's where marriage altars are essential. That means a husband and a wife pray together. That is where family altars are essential. That talks of the father, the mother, and calling upon their children or any other person within that house and also teaching them the ways of the Lord and erecting an altar. That is where family is led to church. No one is left behind. This thing of leaving your children behind or leaving them in the house or leaving them to go into another place is out of order. You must have similarity of vision as a family where literally you know this is where we are going, this is what we are achieving, so that you can be able to assess are we really developing in the same order that God has intended because the Bible says that God says I know Abraham he says I know him he will command his children and his household after him and that they shall keep the way of the Lord so there must be an assessment what you received are you seeing it reflected in your own house is the same thing being spoken through consistently as my big daughter grew up, my elderly daughter, I would always challenge her and tell her, as you grow older, your prayer level must also be the same. I would challenge her into fasting and prayer. I would challenge her into reading the Bible. I'm doing the same also with the younger ones that we are also having. Why? Because my family has to be in that context. It's something that you have to constantly have a dream over. The same way that you have a vision for your family that you will also be able to raise up an inheritance where you'll have properties to leave your children with. You Inheritances are not not just natural. In fact, the least inheritance is natural inheritance. Money can fade away. 
a property can disappear, but there are inheritances that are, that can never die. They 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 are value. They they have no value attached to them. Every time life people keep on moving in life, their value keeps on increasing. One of them is a godly a godly lifestyle. Okay, a godly inheritance where you impart in them the fear of God and you train them in the ways of God. Another one is to impart in them right ways of thinking or vision. Okay, to give them the vision that they would need. Another one is to give them wisdom, the ability to make right decisions in life. But the foundation of all is to impart in them the fear of God and to train them in the ways of God. And that is why you must have a family corporate altar. It's very essential, whether it will be one that you're doing with your children, whether it will be one that you're taking your family to, you must have one altar that is consistently speaking over your life. In Acts chapter number 16, we see a man that has an encounter with God after Paul and Silas are able to pray. Immediately after they are able to pray, the person who was a jailer, the Bible explains, if you can go, go with me to Acts chapter uh, number 16, Acts chapter 16, okay? Verse number 27, just go with me just briefly there. Let me show you something. 27 going downwards. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew a, his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled, had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell before Paul and Silas. L listen to verse 30. And they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is what the jailer is actually crying out to Paul for. And listen to what they answered. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to me, and thou shalt be saved and thy house also. He said, you will be saved, but God's interest is not just for you to be saved, but also your house to be saved. Please, Elaine, mute. Elaine, kindly just mute. So he says, not only shall you be saved, he says, even your house shall be saved. So God will always look for one person, but his interest is to go through that person into the entire house. So he says, even your house shall be saved. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. That's how salvation came into this house because that one man opened his own house. Look at Acts chapter number 10. Quickly go there in Acts chapter number 10. Let's see another house also being affected. In Acts chapter number 10, listen to what now the scripture explains here. And there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the, I mean, called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, the angel of the Lord coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayer and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name is Peter, whose son name is Peter. And he lodged with one Simon Atana, whose house is by the Tana I mean, is by the seaside, uh, seaside, and he shall tell thee what, what thou oughtest to do. So he's explaining to him that I want you to experience salvation. You have been doing good religious works, but now it is time that experience salvation. And so we see later throughout the story what exactly happened. Peter himself has an encounter, and just stay with me here. Peter himself has an encounter, and later on we are actually able to observe something profound that took place when Peter actually appeared, okay? So Peter, the Bible explains, now was able to come and begin to preach to them. The scripture records that as he began to preach to them, the Holy Spirit was manifested amongst them. Verse number 34, okay? Uh, let, let's see verse 33 first of all. Um, verse 33. Uh, let's go to verse 31 first of all. And say, Cornelius, thy prayer is hard and thy arms are, are, are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call Simon Peter. Okay, let's jump. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he is feared and worketh righteousness. And I mean to him that is accepted with him. Uh, it says the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching, okay, explains all that, uh, but we get to see in verses number 44 that while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word 
and they of the circumcision believed that, and I mean, the circumcision which believed were astounded as, as, as many came with Peter because on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they had them speak in tongues and magnified God. Now, in reading this scripture, you will get to see here that what exactly was taking course is that the household of Cornelius and even those that were under him, all of them got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. So we see Cornelius influencing his entire house to come under a godly altar. And immediately the entire house was affected by this. Please listen to me. You must allow a godly altar to take course in your family intentionally by establishing it in your own house and also leading your family to a corporate altar in which God can be declared over them. And a mantle that is corporate can also be able to cover your entire household. A corporate altar or a godly altar can also be initiated through acts of obedience to divine laws, can be initiated to acts of obedience to divine laws. So that is to say that in every family, if you actually want to see a corporate altar being established, you see it by the blessing. Now, anytime there are acts of obedience to divine laws, what usually manifests is the blessing of God. The blessing of God is very active. You can see this in Deuteronomy 28, verse number one. The Bible explains that if you will be diligent to observe, to do, now this is a, a Moses speaking, all the commandments I give you and the voice of the Lord. The Bible says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and they shall overtake you. So in observance of divine laws and the leadings of God, then automatically it means an altar finds establishment. For example, when we tithe, we bind our family to a corporate altar, or we bring our family into an altar that will speak consistently over them every time we are tithing. Another one is when we are fasting, we bring our family also under an altar that is activated to speak for them generationally. We looked at Isaiah 58 and verse number 12, and also we can find this in Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 10 to verse 12, and also Hebrews chapter number 7, verse number 7 to verse number 9. All of these are acts that bring a binding of a generation consistently to have an altar speaking for them. In Genesis 22, we have a clear account of Abraham offering his only son Isaac when he set up an altar that bound generations after him eternally to experience what he was doing before God. When he offered Isaac, God says, with all your hand, for now I know that you love me. But what God was looking for was to get into a covenant with a man so that he would bind a generation for, I mean, for eternity in a blessing that spoke for them. So we see in the same place where Abraham actually erected an altar, we see the same place David erecting an altar in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verses number 24. David also erects an altar in the same place. And we also see Solomon building the temple in the same, same place, very same place. Solomon built a temple right there. So generations are affected by that. We also get to see in 1 Kings chapter number 18, when we see Elijah challenging an entire nation and telling them to come out of Baal worship and bringing them to Mount Carmel, where he knew there was an existent altar that was of God. And the scripture records that after the Baal worshippers had failed in provoking their God to bring a fire down to consume their sacrifice, but he erected an altar or repaired the altar of God and the fire of God appeared in that very same place. He was able to turn an entire nation back to God because when the altars of God are erected by obedience, you will see that same altar binding an entire generation into acts of the blessing of the Lord. Please listen to me. You can only have two altars existing in a family. It can either be godly or demonic. So very quickly, I have five minutes. I want to explain how you can be able to break demonic altars and establish godly altars. Number one, how do I break demonic altars in my family? The first way that you can be able to do so is through salvation. The moment you get born again, immediately, you have immediately initiated or permitted God to manifest into the scenario. So that means you have received the strength to begin the journey to fight negative altars in your family. Just the same way we read in Judges chapter number six, before Gideon could attend to breaking the altar in his father's house, if we first see him erecting an altar to God and calling it Jehovah Shalom. So he had an encounter first with God because you cannot fight an altar stronger than you. 
You must be stronger than that altar if you will deal with it. So in accepting God, the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Immediately, Jesus comes into your heart. The greater one is in you. So that means that the strength you have can now give you power to deal with a strong man that has been fighting your family. So accept Jesus. That's the first thing you do. Number two, the second way is through acts of identificational repentance. Acts of identificational repentance. You do repentance so that the ground or the whole the enemy has in your family or your bloodline he might re he might now lose it because as long as he has a hold and he legally had it then you have no power to break it you must first repent and renounce and in so doing you have now reclaimed the ground and now permitted the lordship of jesus to immediately take us number three is by destroying it through warfare by rebuking it or by acts of pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and verse 24, Hebrews 12, verse 24, it says, we have come to the mediator, even Jesus himself, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. So the moment we come into covenant with God, we now can now utilize that same blood and plead it against demonic altars that are existent in our family. But number four, it's important to understand that in every battle you engage, add things like fasting, add things like prayer, add holiness, in the aspect of spiritual warfare and add sacrifices so that the altars can be eternally broken. And the last one is by walking in obedience to divine laws, walking in obedience to divine laws so that you establish the altar of God to have typical root and it cannot be broken again. Remember, you're not just intending to break an altar and then to assume it is okay. After you have broken it, your work now is to erect an altar. And that's where I want to suggest again, three things that you can be able to do. So you break, but you also establish. If all you do is to break, then know very well that the enemy can still come back again. You break, but you also establish. So how do you establish? One, acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in your family. The fact that you're born again is good. But let Jesus be acknowledged as a Lord of that family. Pronounce him as Lord. Even if not everyone is born again, take the name of your family and say, Lord, unto this family, we acknowledge you as Lord. That's what the book of Joshua teaches us. That Joshua declared, as for me and my house, it was a public decree. We shall serve the Lord. He bound his house towards serving God. So acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. Listen, if a person can be bound to a curse, then a person can also be bound to a blessing. There's a man of God who was giving his own testimony. He was a friend of mine, though he passed away. He said he met a man of God. He said that time he was not born again, but he came to install. Uh, then I think there was this telephone company, I forgot it, it was called Posta in Kenya. So he visited a particular man of God. And when he went to his house, he was installing uh, the landline. And uh, he says he was not born again. He was a drunkard and a womanizer. But when he walked into the house of this man of God, this man of God preached to him salvation. The guy refused to get born again. But he says before he left, this man of God slapped him on the back. And then he made this statement. He said, I bind you to Christ. Eternally, you will live for God and you will serve him. The guy just left. But he said that decree affected him. That's why when some of us make certain very strange prayers, don't be surprised. When we lead people to Christ, and some people reject. We say, Lord, these are prayers we pray. Do not permit them to have any peace until they leave, give their lives to you. Why we say so is because our prayer, we are leaving them with the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Ghost can convict men of sin righteousness. So we are saying, trouble them. This guy says, when this man of God tapped him and said, Lord, I bind him to you. He said he didn't take more than five days. He found himself in church, gave his life to Christ. And guess what? He became a man of God. And let me tell you, he made an impact, a serious impact. So the same way people can be bound to a curse, people can also be bound to a blessing. So acknowledge God and declare that as for me and my house, we shall serve God. Those are decrees that you have to learn to make. Bind your children to such. Speak to your children and tell them over your life, have I made a prayer? You will live for God. Let me tell you, if they will ever attempt to go into sin, believe me, because of the prayer of their parents, they will find themselves coming back. People like uh, uh, Kenneth Hagen Jr. gives a testimony of how he was veering off in disobedience, but how he found himself back to God because of the parents' prayer. People like um, uh, uh, Pat Robertson, his son is called Richard Robertson. He says how the son was moving out 
but how the son came back because of the prayers and the decrees of the parent. Uh, I mean, I can give you stories. I mean, the uh, Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, Billy Graham, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham was also in disobedience. He had rebelled against God for about two years and went to a loose lifestyle when he was about over 18 years of age. But he came back to the Lord and he's serving God zealously because of the decree and the parents of his, I mean, the prayer of his family. So one, acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus and declare it over your family. Number two, the second way that you establish a godly altar is you have to completely walk in obedience to divine laws. You have to do so. You have to do so. Things like tithing, things like fasting and prayer, the things like living a holy life, it's a very critical affair. Now, let me give you a scripture very quickly. I'm about to close. If you look at Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter number 20, okay? Proverbs 20, you can also look at Psalms chapter number 112 and Psalms 128, but look at Proverbs chapter number 20. I'm closing here, but listen to what it says in Proverbs 20 and verses number seven. Listen to this. The Bible says a just man walketh in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. So the walk of the just, the walk of the just automatically creates a blessing. Uh, one last scripture, please allow me. Romans chapter number five and verses number 19. Romans five and verse 19. Listen to what it says here. The Bible says, by the offense, but not by Romans five and verse 19, I'm sorry. For as by one man's disobedience, many are made sinners. So by one man's obedience shall many be made righteous. Your obedience as a parent, your obedience as a son in that family, automatically can cause many to be led to righteousness. But every time you disobey, you create a loophole and it brings warfare. I'll finish with a story of one of the people I had as a spiritual son. This guy stood in the family to believe God for salvation in his family. And indeed, God visited his family and God began to save his family. That time he went to the UK. His elder brother and elder sister were also in the UK. So he flew and was together with them. He was the only one born again and he stood in prayer and fasting out of the training, we trained them to believe God. So uh, the story goes that his brother got born again. His, I mean, his sister also got saved. And after they both got born again, uh, the guy was excited, he introduced them to this particular church and they all began to go there. His parents also got saved back here in Kenya. But he said one day, uh, he actually got into a mess while he was in campus. He slept with a particular lady and broke his virginity that day. The day he sinned, this is a true story, that day he just sinned. It, was, it wasn't that he had a sequence of sinning. He just sinned once. The day he sinned, it's like a Pandora box was open. His sister, the youngest, he was actually, she was actually the younger sister, all of a sudden had a major demonic attack. She was a nurse in that particular land. She had a major demonic attack, very nasty attack. And she would always just be having demonic visitations and it was bad. The elder brother got drunk. Uh, he went for a particular party and uh, found himself sleeping around, which he wasn't, it wasn't a sculpture, and woke up. And uh, that's when he was actually accused that he had actually raped a particular lady he never knew and found himself in jail. Just because of one act of disobedience, a guy had to go into repentance and really pleaded with God. When he actually pleaded with God in repentance, God showed him mercy. God just, first of all, delivered the sister out of the demonic visitation, and the brother just found mercy before the law and was declared innocent and released. Listen, when God has set you up as a watchman in a family, please don't mess yourself. Be very careful. Because if you are you really have to stay put. Be a watchman. Don't allow the enemy to find any loophole. The Bible says, while men slept, the enemy saw tears. Father, we thank you. Thank you that demonic altars will find no ground in our face. They are broken in Jesus. We finally rise up and establish an altar that will trace your name in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. I want, we will now be moving to deal with patterns. And in the process, probably by Friday, we will now pray against these things and establish. And let's keep, having said that,
I'm very sorry about that. I'm very sorry about that. I think I had a bit of a problem. Let me give us room now to be able to give our offerings. Uh, there's a TIL number that will actually be made available. The TIL number is 581. Send in your offering, the TIL number will be tabulated there. The TIL number is 581854. There's also an MPESA number. You could also utilize the number is 0722572363. 0722572363. Go ahead and send in your offering, whether through the TIL number or you could also use the phone number. Uh, if you're on Facebook, I think they have typed it. If you are on Zoom, it's also on the chat box. Numbers again for the last time, TIL number 581854. Phone number 0722572363. Let's pray for your offering. Father, bless every seed that we are giving today. Let it be multiplied and let your name be glorified in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you, I've exceeded a bit, but I trust that you have been blessed. Let's see you, ah, not tomorrow. Let me first remind you, tonight we are having a communion service at exactly 7.30. Please be a part of that communion service. I'll be glad to have you join us, and I trust that you will be blessed even as we come in together to have a wonderful day. Amen.